So first of all, thanks everyone for joining this session. I am very, very excited and uh, very happy to, um, to have uh, Jan and Max with me. I think it's gonna be a super interesting session. Um, let me say, uh, first of all, I'm incredibly um, happy to this time talking about the Netherlands. And since uh, it's a country uh, to which I'm really connected, First of all, for a personal reason, my girlfriend is Dutch, and uh, so a lot of what I'm doing in circular economy is really expired by what the Netherlands is doing. And, um, and so I have to say that, uh, yeah, Tondo took a lot of inspiration, both from circular economy, the circular economy is gonna be here, and uh, also the other organization, very important in the Netherlands, it's also metabolic. So I think uh, a lot of what I'm doing is really inspired by them. And so I'm, I'm really happy to have them with, uh, with us today. So, um, um, so just sharing with you the agenda. So I will shortly introduce Tondo to, to explain what it is. And, 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 and I will do a short introduction about what Rotterdam is doing. After me, there will be Max from Secret Economy. He will present two uh, studies they have done on, um, on Rotterdam. And after that, there will be Jan, the partner of SuperU Studios, um, which will present a different project like uh, Blue City they have developed in Rotterdam. And finally, we will have 10 minutes of Q&A to answer to, to your questions. So uh, briefly introducing Tondo, what is Tondo? Tondo is a non-profit organization that was born uh, kind of a little bit more than one year ago. Uh, we are focusing on a circular economy and our main, uh, um, we want to be a bridge between universities that are corporate institution and people. Um, what we do, we mainly do three kinds of activities. First of all, we, uh, we, fer uh, we favor the diffusion of knowledge regarding uh, circular economy, like uh, this webinar, our blog, or our podcast that we have just uh, launched, and, but also by developing our own research and studies. In the next uh, few months that will come out, we will come out with three different studies. Um, one we are developing on uh, mapping circular startups in Italy, and another one we are developing on the circular fashion, and another one we are developing on the impact of COVID on uh, circular economy. The third element, the second element is the ecosystem. First of all, as being um, an association, we are open to everyone who wants to join, both as a volunteer or as an associate, since we believe that um, we only with the white network we an intelligence network we can really develop um the circular economy and uh, secondly we also operate uh, to develop our ecosystem through rethink it's a series of events like this webinar in which we try to uh, get in contact also with the other international entities like circular economy super U studios but previously we had people from ljubljana or from sao paulo and we will continue like this and the third element, we also want to be, we define ourselves not as a think tank, but more as an action tank. So we also like to, uh, uh, to develop projects on the, um, in, the, in, in Italy, like the project that we are developing in supporting uh, the recycling of cigarette butts. So um, in reality, as Tondo, uh, since we really believe that the ecosystem is the most important part, we have developed three main elements. So there is Tondo, as a non-profit, we focus more on people, research institute, public institution, to, to really develop the basic, the knowledge about the circular economy. The second element, as I said, is Britink, where we showcase possible solution. And the third element is uh, now with a company, is a benefit corporation that we have created, the people of Tondo, to support company to quickly implement circular solution. And, and, and on that, where we start, we start from an assessment of the situation, we support on education and workshop, and finally, we try to match different actors in order to really develop circular economy solution. So this is us, but let's move now to, to the topic of the day. So Rotterdam. So I will try to be very brief, and as our guest, we will talk much more in details of the different topic, but more to present uh, on a, high level what the city has done and which I think is very uh, impressive. Um, so in, first of all, they started with a vision and a strategy. Um, so the vision was that they wanted to reduce uh, primary resource use by 50% for 2030. And the idea was to become completely circular by um, um, 2050. 
At the same time, the other important element was to creating jobs. Uh, so using circular economy uh, to, as a leverage to create a new kind of jobs. And the other important element they, that they understood in the first analysis is by being a, a, a very important harbor, they understood that the circular economy in reality, these flows of materials lies in, uh, in, at the intersection between the city and the port. For this reason, today we will talk about both the city of Rotterdam and the port of Rotterdam. So what they've done. So uh, I, I think the most important par part of the municipality, the, what they, they had done at the beginning, they understood the importance of, of, of a little bit what we are doing. So raising awareness. So uh, changing the culture of a place is probably one of the most important thing. And the campaign, they have launched the campaign from trash to treasure. So in order to understand that uh, that trash is actually a very important element from which you can get many materials. And so um, there was a very important campaign to involve all the people of Rotterdam to push them also to develop new initiatives. At the same time, they tried to develop different kind of activity also to support uh, circular economy principles. So with subsidies, uh, supporting consortium, regulation, lobbying, and then a third element has been also to uh, support the creation of different circular incubators like Blue City, Plant One, RDM. We'll talk more about Blue City later with, uh, with our guests. The other important point that the municipality understood is the collaboration. How much is important in order to really push circular economy to support, um, to really adapt the legislation and the regulation in order to, to follow circular economy. Also another important element is all the parts of the procurement and so try to adapt the tendering pol uh, policies of the municipality in order to support circular economy projects. At the same time, sh uh, shifting or supporting the asset, the municipality asset to allow circular design and experimentation. But really what I think is probably uh, the most important step that they took in the, um, in the to, work, to move toward a circular economy has been the uh, the urban metabolism analysis. So they started and this they started together and Max will explain much better. Um, they started in material flow analysis in order to understand there are, there are many tools that it's, it's quite a complex topic um, I suggest you also to, to look at the um, report that they, they have developed but uh, also Max will explain uh, more about uh, the material flow analysis so they started from all the materials that uh, they have been using in the city and understanding in which sectors in, in order to, to, to understand what so uh, what to understand where is the, the most value lost and what is the impact of this waste. And also, uh, so in this way, uh, also what are the employment opportunities that they can come from, um, uh, from this waste. And so the, the second step was really, once they've done a mapping analysis, they, they tried to develop workshop and understanding all the possible initiatives that could have been developed. First of all, they understood what were the most important areas. They found uh, that construction, agri-food, consumer goods, and healthcare were, were for them the most relevant areas. And after they, they developed different workshops in order to understand what kind of initiatives could have been uh, developed, to in this specific sector that at the same time they could bring value. They started with the seven projects which Max will talk about, but in reality during the year they arrived to almost 60 projects that you can find on, uh, on the site of Rotterdam Circular. They are, they are incredibly interesting, all of them. And the other important element, so in a similar way, they also analyzed the port and understood what is the, the waste flow inside the port. And um, so they, again, they're starting from a vision, uh, they, anal they analyzed the waste flow, uh, understood the most relevant materials, and again, define possible project and solutions. The last point I want to, to talk is, uh, in reality, the most important area uh, that they define, and this is why there is also Jan, has been considered the construction sector, in which they have done uh, many different projects that Jan will explain much better following. And uh, one of these projects, as you know, is Blue City. Blue City, in reality, is, is both has been both an architecture project where they recovered an, a, a, an area 
but also uh, Blue City became an incubator, a place for new initiative, for innovation. And uh, so, um, so Blue City really represented in a way uh, the circular economy development in the city. So this is my short introduction and uh, I will stop sharing my screen and let Max explain uh, the projects that I've developed with circular economy in, um, in Rotterdam. Yes, uh, thanks Francesco. Uh, and thank you Tondo for the invitation to be able to speak uh, to everybody today. Um, it's great to have so many participants as well, over 150. Um, so as uh, Francesco briefly mentioned, um, I work for Circle Economy. Uh, I'm a project manager at Circle Economy, uh, specifically in the cities team. Um, and what Circle Economy is, is we're a, an impact uh, organization based in Amsterdam. Um, and we work with cities, but also businesses in certain uh, focus areas uh, to accelerate the transition towards a circular economy. Um, our name kind of gives our purpose away uh, a little bit. Um, but throughout our, our time as an organization, we've had the privilege to be able to work uh, with Rotterdam on a couple of occasions um, to be able to help support their transition towards uh, becoming a more circular city uh, towards a circular economy. Um, so as uh, Francesco kind of briefly mentioned, um, Rotterdam is quite an interesting city in that it has such a huge um, port. It's kind of a city built up of two parts. You have the city, like a conventional city will, uh, which is to the east of this uh, little map. But then you also have uh, this port, and uh, it's the biggest port in Europe. Um, it wants to be the world's, it positions itself as the world's smartest port as well. Um, so as uh, was mentioned before, the circular economy really lies between the intersection and the interaction between these two different elements. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to work with Rotterdam in both of these uh, different focus areas. One together with uh, Metabolic, uh, focusing on, on the city more broadly, um, and then also with the Port of Rotterdam Authority, uh, really focusing on circularity in the port. So this presentation, I'll kind of guide you and take a journey through uh, the, um, yeah, the journey of how um, they're pursuing the circular economy uh, in Rotterdam in both of these areas. Um, I won't dwell on this too much. I'm assuming most people are clued in a little bit to what the circular economy is uh, coming to this webinar. Um, but it's basically, uh, in short, um, a viable alternative um, to our current linear economy, which is built up of or built from the foundation of we take things, we make things and we waste things. The circular economy is really centered around um, designing out waste uh, from the very start and clobing, closing resource loops um, as much as possible. Now, the circular economy is a really attractive prospect for cities as well. Um, I mean, cities are these huge uh, sinks of resources and uh, agglomerations of people and business. Um, but the circular economy uh, presents some really kind of tantalizing opportunities, not just in terms of environmental benefits towards the city, uh, in terms of reducing uh, resource consumption and material consumption, reducing CO2 emissions, um, but there's also some potential benefits in a bit more of a social economic sense, um, looking at opportunities to maintain value within the local uh, economy, um, to create jobs uh, and to boost competitiveness uh, as well through innovation. Um, so as Francesco mentioned briefly earlier, uh, Rotterdam is really interested in, in the circular economy. They see it, they see these and they recognize these potential benefits of the circular economy. And they've committed following the Netherlands uh, uh, example, they've committed to becoming uh, fully circular by 2050. And with some more intermediate milestones of creating jobs and reducing uh, raw material consumption um, by 2030 as well. So they really have started with this vision of uh, the circular economy is something we should strive towards. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so when we have uh, worked with Metabolic uh, and in collaboration with the city of Rotterdam on this, uh, on this study, the first question that a lot of cities as well as Rotterdam come uh, when they want to pursue the circular economy, they have this vision. They come and it's, the circular economy is maybe a bit of a broad topic, it's quite maybe a, um, 
agnostic and it's very malleable to different situations. So it could be quite, or it can be quite overwhelming to start for a city about where could we start or where should we start? Which parts of our city have the best potential to kickstart our transition towards a circular economy? So this is what we tried to answer um, with the city of Rotterdam uh, specifically. Now it's really important to note that, I mean, needless to say, all the cities uh, are unique. Um, they have their own unique history, they have their own unique uh, culture, government, uh, governance, ambitions. Um, and transitioning towards a circular economy, it's really crucial to understand that unique character of the city, uh, to really understand what makes the city tick, to see where it's specialized in, uh, to see where there's momentum and uh, kind of innovation potential, um, so that that could really um, drive forward things like the circular economy. Um, so there's it's important to understand where there's fertile ground for certain circular solutions to come in. Um, so this is what the study started out with, is really understanding the historical perspective in Rotterdam. Um, and it's, uh, the city of Rotterdam uh, from the start has taken a really multi-stakeholder uh, uh, approach uh, to, uh, to their process and really involving um, businesses, but also different uh, departments of the local government to work out what this transition means for Rotterdam. So in the city, um, four focus sectors were selected. Um, Agri-food and green flows. Um, this, is a, this constitutes a huge uh, amount of resources that flow into the city to feed the population. Uh, but also in Rotterdam, uh, a number of large multinational organizations uh, like uh, Unilever, are, they have their headquarters based in Rotterdam. So it's quite a strategic uh, focus area. Consumer goods, um, if you're looking at the port, it's a hub of wholesale uh, and the trade of these consumer goods. So that's also an interesting focus area. Healthcare, um, Rotterdam has a kind of a pharmaceutical cluster uh, within the city, uh, centered around uh, one of the large hospitals, uh, Erasmus MC. Um, so that was another focus area and construction. Um, Rotterdam is a city famous uh, for its architecture and its construction. Um, so this was also another focus sector. So then once kind of understanding the foundations of, the, uh, of, of Rotterdam, the key question is, and a lot of cities have this as well, is okay, how circular are we? What, what is the current circular state of, of Rotterdam? And now to do this, uh, we employ a method which is uh, an urban metabolism analysis. Now, usually when you talk about metabolism, you think of a person, you think of, uh, we all have metabolisms. Um, we eat food, we consume energy and nutrients, um, and this really supports our bodily functions, our different organs, uh, etc. Uh, and we also produce waste. But you can also think of a city uh, and the, sit the system of a city similar uh, in respect to that. Um, cities consume resources um, and those resources help the, syst the urban system function. Um, so whether that be mobility, uh, or creating buildings um, or uh, yeah, the energy system. Um, it really helps the organs or the sectors of the city to function. And of course, it produces waste. Um, now we know cities have a huge impact uh, environmentally on the, on the planet. Um, so just as if your metabolism of a person was going wrong, you'd have a scan, a medical scan to identify where some of the kind of uh, intervention points or what was going wrong. We do a similar thing with a city as well. So I'll briefly take you through um, and uh, what we do is a material flow analysis. Um, now I'll quickly go over this. We don't need to necessarily dive into the nitty gritty. It's, uh, you can definitely look at the report if you really like uh, all the figures and numbers. But wait, basically what the material flow analysis looks at is it looks at the inputs of materials. What materials are coming into the city? What types of materials are coming into the city? Um, and it's looking at to what function these materials are going towards. Um, and that relates to the key focus areas uh, that I mentioned before, um, consumer goods, construction. So the, these are all the inputs of this urban system. Now, what we also do is we map out the flows of the outputs. So all of the waste that's produced, all of the minerals that come out of the city uh, that are not necessarily productive, also the emissions and the wastewater that flow out of the city. And then finally, what we do is we map and we look at how these materials, how these outputs are managed 
uh, after they are, are released uh, from the urban system? Are they recycled? Are they landfilled? Are they incinerated? So through this picture, what you can start to do is then you can start to really identify certain um, inflection points where you can make and leverage change or certain challenges uh, in the urban system of Rotterdam. So, for example, um, Rotterdam at the moment uh, only recycles 22% of its solid waste, which if you're pursuing a circular city, um, that's not the best uh, result so far. Um, but you can also look at the consumption, the type of consumption of materials. Um, Rotterdam has a huge consumption of uh, construction materials, virgin construction materials, which them themselves have associated environmental impact. And if you trace those construction materials through the system of, Rot of Rotterdam, um, the way they're managed um, loses a lot of value. It's a lot of it, the vast majority of those materials are down cycled. So through this urban metabolism analysis, you can look at a lot of different factors and you can zoom in to try and identify certain hotspots of intervention. Uh, so then after identifying these uh, different challenges, it's really important uh, through this process we got uh, a lot of uh, businesses and the local government as well to come together through workshops to really identify and turn these challenges into opportunities. Uh, so identifying some of the uh, particular strategies that could bring uh, uh, Rotterdam into a more circular uh, future. So I don't have time to go into the whole uh, findings of the report. Um, I definitely recommend you to, to dive into this. Uh, but together through a series of workshops, um, it was a process of transforming some of the ideas, these circular ideas into, into circular strategies. Um, so one, one example is if you cast yourself back to the, the downcycling of construction materials that was identified as a challenge. One of the solutions um, that was presented in the reports was to try and establish a marketplace for these materials that can then be used as input from, from other, uh, for, other uh, for, for the sector itself. Now, in Rotterdam, there's some examples already of this happening. Um, Berman is a really cool example. Um, it's the warehouse of uh, uh, secondary uh, wood material. This is what the photo of the background in. Um, but it's really important to, to scale these up um, using things similar. There's an example, a Dutch company called the Excess Materials Exchange, which uses this uh, digital dashboard um, as a marketplace for these excess uh, construction materials. Uh, another one, um, another opportunity that was identified was uh, stimulating circular buildings, again, in the construction sector. Um, one really amazing example, which Jan will uh, talk about later, is Blue City. This is kind of the epitome of circular construction. It's, uh, it's really, really amazing. Um, and it's designing, so it's really trying to design buildings systemically um, that can allow for disassembly or renovation that can prolong the lifespan of these different buildings, but then also you reuse materials. So it's interesting when you're looking at these different strategies and the interlinkages between the different strategies as well. Um, the material marketplace is interesting because often it's limited uh, when you just when you um, demolish a building, you often get uh, it's often heavy destruction, so you don't get um, valuable materials or high value uh, materials from this. So designing and building the, uh, the buildings um, in a way that they can be disassembled for the components to be reused again and again, um, you support such a material marketplace as well. So there's a lot of interplay between the different strategies that are suggested. Um, and through the report, um, there were similar hotspots and strategies that were identified for agri-food. Again, there's a few really awesome examples of these uh, strategies already happening in Rotterdam. And again, for healthcare and uh, consumer goods uh, as well. Now, the report uh, found that through the strategies that were suggested in the reports, this could have huge impacts on, on Rotterdam um, from food waste, reducing food waste, reducing packaging waste, and reducing construction waste uh, as well. Now, um, moving on to the port of Rotterdam, I mean, obviously, it's really important, as I mentioned before, this interlinkage and the interplay um, between the port and the city. Um, and it's interesting that the slight different characteristics between the two spheres, the city and the ports, um, 
they have certain characteristics, but also certain different challenges and certain opportunities as well. So we, uh, for the past few years, have been working with the Port of Rotterdam Authority to do a deep dive about what the circular economy could mean for the Port of Rotterdam itself. Um, similarly, the Port Authority has ambitions. Um, they want to be carbon neutral by 2050. And crucially, they see the circular economy as a means uh, to meet those carbon neutrality targets. Um, these different elements are the circular principles that the port is trying to really embrace in their transition towards a circular economy. So prolonging life, um, high value reuse, closing cycles. And similarly to, similar to, similarly to the city, um, the port also uh, came with the question, what is our current st circular state? Um, but interestingly, um, or another caveat to the port is that obviously a port is a hub of global trade. They have a huge amount of throughput of, of, of materials and products, um, but they weren't necessarily sure. Um, there, were, well, there was no one consistent database of, um, how, of the quantities and the qualities and the types of materials that were coming through the port. There was a lot of disparate um, data sets that didn't necessarily match. So what we helped the port do was to um, combine all of these different data sets and analyze, um, uh, analyze them into one coherent picture about all the flows that come through the port. Now this is maybe a bit overwhelming. It's very, uh, there's a lot of flows that come in. This is simplified a little bit. So this is looking at plastics and rubber and it helps the port identify how much of a certain material are coming into the ports and where are they coming from. Um, so interestingly, there's a large um, uh, proportion that comes from the surrounding metropolitan region, um, from the Hague in, uh, by the coast, also to the city of Rotterdam. This Rotterdam metropolitan area uses the port as its kind of key or one of its key waste management um, areas. But then also they have a lot of waste that comes from uh, the southern regions of Holland, um, but also internationally, a lot of waste is shipped in um, either to the port to get incinerated from, for example, the UK, or it's a throughput and transit to the rest of the world. Um, so through identifying what types of materials and what quantities of materials are coming through the port, the port can then really identify some of the circular opportunities uh, to build on and start capitaling, uh, capitalizing on uh, these uh, opportunities for the circular economy. Uh, so similarly, similarly to the city of Rotterdam, um, the next logical question that they were asking is, okay, cool, this is great. Um, what circular strategies can deliver on our ambitions and deliver the best results? Um, so what this report came to, and it came up with four kind of focus pathways um, towards a circular economy in the port. I probably don't have time to go into each one in detail, but as a brief overview, uh, the first one is building an innovat innovation ecosystem. Um, the port is a really interesting um, opportunity in terms of its characteristics. It has a lot of uh, space, um, which is quite distant from housing. Um, so they can really facilitate the testing of a lot of innovative um, uh, circular strategies um, that's in a relatively regulation low zone, as opposed to if you're in the city itself. So then that's really interesting to uh, explore synergies between innovation in the port and testing new ideas in the port, and then bringing that to the city of Rotterdam as well. Another opportunity was advanced sorting and recycling systems. Um, as the image, uh, the, the flow map uh, previously uh, highlighted, a lot of this uh, waste is coming into the port from the surrounding metropolitan region, uh, which is getting processed in the, in the ports. So building on advanced uh, sorting and recycling schemes uh, and systems can really support the port, but also the region in embracing and pursuing more circularity. Uh, another one is industrial symbiosis. Um, that is, uh, the port has a, a large cluster of um, uh, refining and manufacturing industries, uh, heavy industries um, that need a lot of different byproducts. And they, uh, for example, oil refinery um, releases a lot of heat. That heat as a waste uh, could be used as an input uh, for, another, uh, um, for another sector or another, another industry. And then finally, the last pathway uh, was carbon capture and storage that they wanted to pursue to really uh, embrace the um, 
uh, the net zero uh, carbon by 2050. And already in the port, there's some really cool examples of some of this already happening um, in terms of the innovation innovation ecosystem. Plant One is this incubating space. Uh, RDM in the innovation doc um, really provide facilities for small start uh, startups um, to mature and validate their uh, technologies. Ionica um, is one of those industries that uh, came from uh, port, uh, port One. Uh, the, in, uh, the incubation system. Um, so it's already coming into fruition uh, about this. And they have this really amazing chemical recycling of PET waste as well. Um, and there's already examples of industrial symbiosis as well. So Rotterdam has now taken these uh, findings from, uh, from the study that we did with, uh, together with Metabolic and adopted this uh, program for circular, uh, circularity within the next four to five years. Uh, to really build on the suggestions, uh, but not also stick to those suggestions, but how to do it a bit more systemically to encourage a huge amount of uh, businesses and an ecosystem of circular businesses. Um, so, I mean, as Francesco said uh, before, um, there's a really growing community of circular initiatives in Rotterdam that are really embracing the notion of circularity to create value, to create jobs, um, and to pursue uh, this transition again supported by the city and the port itself. Um, so that's a quick run through um, of Rotterdam's circular journey to date. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah, great Max. Uh, I think now was a really an amazing presentation. I think um, now Jan can start. You can uh, share your screen, Jan. Good. Thank you, Jan, for being with us. And I will, um, I hope I'm not frozen. <laughs> um, yeah, this is uh, Jan Jonger from CBO Studios. Uh, nice to be here with you. Um, I will uh, share the work we've been doing in the past, uh, yeah, 22 years. Our office, CBO Studios, is uh, already working on the circular construction for over uh, 22 and a half years. We started in 1997. So um, we really uh, started small scale and now are working on larger scale projects employing the circular economy. And we are based in Rotterdam since our start, um, really working on many various examples. Um, we're based uh, like um, in, the, in the Blue City, um, former um, tropical swimming pool. Uh, we're with uh, 16 people uh, working on various uh, projects. Um, next to our Rotterdam office, we have a uh, SuperUse on site that is uh, working on self sufficient communities um, wherever there's a project. And we have a five man uh, SuperUse in China and Beijing. Um, Actually, um, I will give you a, a different scope or actually a niche on the circular economy that uh, we have been developing. Um, and this is actually uh, like an extension on what's now developing as a circular economy, like uh, of course the linear economy and recycling economy are obvious and currently the circular economy is um, picking up. Um, but we see that in some cases, circular economy is also becoming an exclusive, um, yeah, exclusive economy. So we are actually interested in how can we turn this into a much more inclusive and also um, ecologically beneficial system. So we are not there to actually minimize waste, but to actually open uh, the waste buckets to companies that want to produce their own uh, new products and services and contribute to um, yeah, a beneficial natural environment. <clears throat> Since the, the broadcast is from Milan, uh, I thought it was nice to start with a, a research project we did with uh, Isabella Inti from Tempore Uso uh, from Milan, um, where we were investigating the large wholesale market in Milan. This is an overview of the enormous uh, building where, um, yeah, it is actually 
uh, not used very optimally anymore. So we had students from the Politecnico researching the area, looking at the different flows and resources, and actually coming up with different proposals. And one of them was to actually install a recycle lab that actually takes the waste from the market after the market day, tries to turn it into new products that can be sold. And why this is relevant is uh, this project was five years ago. And um, since then, actually, we've been working on a similar project for the city of Rotterdam, where we are looking at uh, the more public market in the south of uh, Rotterdam, um, which is uh, having a lot of waste. We collaborate with a com with an organization that is uh, giving people without jobs uh, new work in collecting waste. And we were doing investigations for them, like what benefits could we have in collecting the waste and sorting it and then actually turning it into new products. So we made an analysis of um, the types of waste that enter the market, which you see on the left, uh, the fruits, vegetables, and then uh, of course products are sold in the purple arrow, but waste is unsorted, uh, collected by, uh, by um, the waste collection company, and this costs around uh, 70,000 euros per year. So that is a, a loss. We calculated that if you would already sort the different types of waste uh, in four different types, you would save uh, half of the cost just because you can get better contracts for uh, the waste disposal. So at the right, you see that we save around half of the, of the cost that we otherwise would spend. Um, but this is, of course, not what our aim is. So uh, we're looking at uh, ways to collaborate, developing new kind of products um, that actually can have a, a positive value instead of a negative value. So uh, new products that can be uh, created with the waste and again sold on the market or in the neighborhood. We were very happy to receive uh, funding by an interesting uh, organization that. Uh, uh, City Lab uh, 010, uh, which is uh, funding to actually start up new innovative ideas in the city of Rotterdam to design a um, resource station for this market, um, which is now in its uh, almost uh, final design stage where we actually uh, collect different waste types from the market. Um, they're sorted, uh, useful types are being collected and maybe sold again or turned into new uh, food types. Um, and other parts are being uh, yeah, compacted and uh, supplied to uh, waste uh, companies. But what we do as well is to collect the information about the amount of waste of different sorts. So also the information we're collecting in the station is something that is shared with the different uh, companies and entrepreneurs in the city of Rotterdam. So they can actually um, see what's coming in and um, take these types of waste and we hope that a growing amount of waste is not recycled or dumped but in the end um, yeah, absorbed by the neighborhood and turned into new products and the market it's uh, yeah this resource station itself also has a roof that uh, collects water and grows its own plants that can be sold on the non-market days Um, well, that's a small uh, scale scope uh, that I present of example, but um, we are also inspired by the global uh, economical um, yeah, uh, loss of value that is actually happening. I say inspired because actually we see opportunities in the yearly enormous amounts of losses uh, that occur. This is a uh, yeah, figure by a, a Canadian organization and they uh, calculated for each type of material, the yearly losses in dollars uh, for, for instance, steel or food. So because one third of the food is not actually ending up on plates or not being consumed, that there's a loss of $1.2 trillion uh, per year. This is not a complete figure yet. So the amount of these losses are much more. And if we think about how in the future is the circular economy going to be financed, it will have to come from these losses. 
Um, and since we realize it's a, it's a global problem and we're also, uh, since the Netherlands is also producing sometimes products in China, we in 2016 started uh, Superuse in China with a fresh team that also uh, implements our way of working in various cities of China. Um, currently, for instance, we're working on a project, really large scale, 150,000 square meter um, um, yeah, industrial site um, that is a little bit similar to the restore station I just showed, but then uh, uh, 100 times, uh, or sorry, 1,000 times bigger. And like I say, we are also looking at data. So for an industrial zone in China, we developed a tool uh, that actually does the metabolic analysis for a um, site. Um, so we take a region, uh, like for the city of Rotterdam as well, we could actually enter the companies. Uh, they note their amounts of waste and resources. They can view each other's resources and the metabolism, the exchange of resources can actually start to grow. The, the first uh, Pulse app that we built was released in a Chinese industrial zone, uh, but we're now working on a, a similar one for the province of Sao Paulo. And we like to match um, yeah, old school, low tech with high tech. And so also we refer to windmills as an example of how in the past 400 years ago, we were very efficient in harvesting energy and um, building uh, buildings that were dismantable, made out of uh, bio materials, um, had a program where things that were produced could be sold on the spot and when it was not uh, efficient on that spot anymore, it could be just ta taken down and rebuilt on another site. Um, well, this is uh, compared to our current day uh, wind mills, um, they are maybe more efficient in energy, although this is not more than 20 to 25%. Uh, um, but in the material use, uh, it's still, I would say, at the middle ages of the development. Um, we find these images of um, graveyards of the windmill blades that are being deployed. We know for Europe, coming three years, we have around 15,000 of these blades being decommissioned and need to be uh, either recycled, but there's no really proper strategy for that yet. So that's where we come in. Uh, we see that they're currently cut in pieces and uh, put into furnaces and really damaging the industrial waste treatment. Um, but when we get commissions, like in Rotterdam, when we were asked to design a playground, um, we use uh, five of these windmill blades to turn them into a yeah, enjoyable playground. So this is uh, the first uh, playground that we built with them. But after this, we started launching a range of uh, different uh, products that can be used in public environments, like uh, next to the Erasmus Bridge, this one has been just renovated. Um, nine windmill blades uh, turned into urban furniture. Or next to the seaside uh, to protect you from the wind. So there's a lot of possibilities we're working on bicycle sheds, uh, bus stops, um, wind uh, uh, funnels, etc. So this is where we get our inspiration from these enormous amounts of uh, waste that are being lost. And we now know that actually in order to adopt the waste emerging, we need to have a process for around two and a half windmill uh, blade per hour in order to accommodate this. Like I said, we are very open source, uh, bottom-up uh, based. So we also try to share the resources we find in our projects as much as possible. This is why we launched uh, Harvest Map. Um, already in 2012, uh, we launched this uh, platform to actually um, yeah, showcase the products that we know are available in, uh, this, in the Netherlands. Um, this year, we sold uh, the Harvest Map to a demolition company who's going to actually upscale the whole platform to get it uh, to the level that it really deserves. Um, but we were able to actually uh, have over 250 resources uh, mapped in the Netherlands and also have small initiatives in Italy, around Como, uh, Milan, uh, and London. Well, to give an example of materials we're using uh, currently is uh, steel from um, uh, steel industry, 
currently transported uh, molten into new steel and then maybe turned into a fence or uh, something uh, as a cladding for a facade. Uh, we think this is a great material, so we actually uh, immediately um, harvest this material and supply it to uh, this waste collection center uh, that was um, yeah, built uh, close to Rotterdam. So uh, 1,500 square meter of facade material is made by, uh, is actually provided by this uh, waste from the steel industry. And the interesting thing is that everyone in the whole chain has a benefit. Uh, so the, also we offer more to the uh, provider of this waste than what you would otherwise get from a waste collection company. Um, the nice thing is that we started really small scale shop interiors, uh, small artistic experiments, but currently we're also working uh, for housing corporations on like renovation of housing where we use um, uh, panels from, uh, from tabletops, etc. to reclad buildings or a new uh, housing complex. Uh, no, not a new housing complex, but actually a renovation of a housing complex in the south of Rotterdam, where 50 dwellings are being renovated, all with harvest map uh, collected material. Um, or we consult uh, housing corporations on their amounts of volumes of materials they actually own. So this is the first map of uh, the materials of half the stock of housing of this housing corporation, uh, 20,000 houses, and compared it to uh, the building that their headquarter is based in, in Rotterdam. So you see that actually uh, around uh, 20 of these towers are owned in the city and we separate uh, the different types of material um, to show them what they have, but also indicate uh, in a map um, even the amount of window frames, the amount of toilets, the amount of uh, door handles, etc., that they actually own. So actually this can be used to either refurbish or build new dwellings in their future. And then together with the Blue City, we're working uh, on a building hub for the city of Rotterdam where um, materials out of Rotterdam um, that are demolished can be uh, collected and uh, gathered with other materials from other suppliers. And then when new um, material is constructed, it can be taken out. So the, uh, it, this results in much less, uh, construct, much less construction waste. And why this is important is because the construction sector uh, in the Netherlands is uh, responsible for over 50% of the total use of resources and the waste that is uh, coming with it. Well, I'm concluding with uh, Blue City. Um, this is a um, uh, yeah, 12,500 square meter former uh, tropical swimming pool. It was uh, one of the first in the Northwest Europe. Uh, very popular, uh, built in the 1980s, but uh, derelict since uh, the beginning of 2000. So uh, with a group of entrepreneurs, we provide, we made a plan uh, to redevelop this whole building into a circular hub uh, according to the principles of the blue economy that I showed in the beginning. So this means that uh, it's not just innovators in uh, knowledge or new products, but also we try to combine the different waste flows and resource flows within uh, the building, which means that we have a diversity of um, actors, like there's a restaurant, there's a beer brewer, there's um, uh, like uh, companies that develop new products with plastic, uh, there's a steel construction company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the build, we found the investor that actually uh, thought this was a great idea and invested um, with us to uh, buy the building. So we now actually own it. Uh, Superuse is also a 1% shareholder of the building. Um, and step by step, we're developing this whole project. Now, the first sketches we made were like this, uh, where uh, we show what the future could look like, but uh, since it's a dynamic development, we know it will in the end uh, look completely uh, different from uh, what we're drawing and this is also what we like that um, activities influence what is happening. First parts that we completed were the offices where 90% uh, of all the materials that you see have been reclaimed from either the city of Rotterdam or uh, the south of the Netherlands 
for instance, wind, uh, windows uh, from uh, a court that was taken down, uh, separated different office spaces. And actually the shape is uh, a result of the size of the material. So also in our design uh, approach, we let ourselves being inspired and led by the type of materials we find and not force the design on our materials. Uh, we also made a harvest map about uh, the applied materials of uh, the blue city. So this shows where everything was obtained from and had a, a CO2 uh, LCA uh, calculation being made. And uh, this resulted that we actually have a 70%, almost 70% lower CO2 impact than if you would build this with high standard uh, sustainable or uh, sustainable materials that you otherwise would buy new on the market. So we're able to actually reduce uh, uh, the construction impact to with a large amount. Many different companies, by now there's almost uh, 50 companies in Blue City. And like I said, it's, it's a, a company ecosystem. So this image uh, shows the, the uh, the future we predict a little bit slower, of course, than what we predicted when we started in 2016. Um, but where in the beginning, a lot of resources are being uh, obtained from outside, still waste is being produced, coming out on the top. But by adding more and more companies that actually are able to absorb other companies' waste, uh, less waste is emitted um, in the end of the building and also less resources are made. And, the experiment is also uh, to actually see if we can uh, intensify the amount of used square meters in such a building by this methodology. Um, I must say that um, uh, yeah, this way of working uh, for uh, Blue City is yeah, really one of the nice places to experiment on many different levels of the ways we're working. And uh, I can only hope that uh, in the cities where everyone uh, participating here, also similar uh, blue cities will start to emerge in the future. Thank you. Really good, Jan. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. Uh, we got different emails, but I seen also Max have been very good in already answering a few. Uh, we got many, sorry, we got many questions, but uh, Max, so let's see if we can find some other ones that uh, haven't been answered uh, yet. Um, so probably we can recover one of the questions that was interesting um, regarding, uh, so let's see, open, there are still 12. Okay, it would be great to hear more about the role of market marker spaces, okay, in transition to circular economy. Maybe. Yeah, do you look them just as hubs for innovation? Uh, who wants to answer? Um, yeah, I can, I can definitely um, provide a little bit. I think Jan would be in a good position being in yeah. Leo and Makerspace, but if I do my two cents, um, I think they're really, especially in such a kind of a niche field, still relatively niche, these Makerspaces are really important to kind of provide a little bit of a proof of concept to inspire a lot of people yeah. what is possible um, but then also that has an educational purpose um, and it's a really kind of tactile and practical way to bring people uh, to show the potential of the circular economy in a very visceral way i know um better future uh, factory i think they're called in in rotterdam um, they have this um facility or this portable machine that you put plastic waste in and it comes out as a 3D yeah. filament. So this is really amazing and you can do these in maker spaces, these really visceral educational opportunities. Yeah, uh, which I think it's, access. yeah, I think it's very cool. And uh, actually I didn't know about RDM, the one uh, Olga is citing and it looks very cool from the site. I just checked it before, probably I think uh, Jan know RDM or he wants to say something about it. Jan, your microphone is muted. Um, yeah, no, so in uh, Blue City is a maker, I would say like the um, great thing is that uh, it has a lab, a bio lab and um, yeah. uh, 
um, yeah, material lab. So uh, actually the renters of the Bluti can also experiment uh, in these labs and the knowledge that's developed there can also be of use to the other uh, companies. So I think actually the, the thinking, uh, uh, analyzing and doing combination is a very important uh, factor in uh, to get to real results. Okay, good. Yeah, totally agree. And I think that, that yeah, as Max said about the testing, it's very important to, to, to really see the results uh, and bring people. It can also be important, I think, for awareness, not to bring people, showcase what really can be done. And I think it's, a, it's an important part. So there is a question about, um, I recovered this one, about material flows, how complex it can be. And um, uh, so how the data of all the material flows are being collected and how difficult it is to collect such broad information for a city. Uh, Max can reply, but uh, just to give you, in any case, there are public information about it. So some a very important source is Eurostat, I think, but uh, there are also national level uh, the, so and local level. So usually public entities have this kind of uh, um, information. I probably Max can give a much more detail and for uh, feedback spe specifically about Rotterdam? Yeah, definitely. Um, short answer, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. As you mentioned, you have these kind of public entities. Yeah. Um, the city will have their own waste collection yeah. um, uh, databases. Of course, when you get to the national level, uh, you have reporting standards at the national level. And then when you go down to the company level, they have their own um, data sources. It's the cities in the middle that it's, it's not co uh, consistent, it's not a coherent picture, um, that you almost have to do a little bit of matching between these bottom-up sources of data from different businesses, matching it with the public data from the city itself, but then also looking and extrapolating down uh, from these national data sets as well. So it's a little bit of a matching exercise, um, and uh, there's a few really cool uh, kind of big projects, Xiobase is one of them, that really, um, tries to to get a comprehensive picture of material flows throughout the economy um, but it's very difficult and it's 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 then asking the question what use are you doing the the the, the data for what use are you doing the the, um, uh, the material flow for is it uh, to get a really comprehensive picture of course that's very important but it's also to inform decisions and to kind of highlight the hot spots at the end of the day we want action yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily an academic, well, I mean, it's academic, of course, and it needs the rigor, but it needs to really inspire these conversations that can then translate into action. Yeah, yeah. As I said at the beginning, I think the material flow analysis is probably at the basic. Uh, so it's at, at the basic, so it's very important to really understand where you have to work, what are the opportunities. So and you can do it at different levels, city and uh, Circular Economy just released the one national level, they also do the one global level. So you can do a different kind of level. It's complex. We are also trying to do it also for in Italy, for Milan, we are trying to do something similar. So, yep, and, uh, but I think it's really the, the basis. Without it, you don't know what actually is happening. So you don't know what you, you can really do. So there is another question uh, from, from your experience, so from Shayam, from your experience, are the potential use cases for waste from decommissioning wind turbines, construction waste, enough to scale up to a level that addresses the volume of waste being generated? Uh, this is a trick one. It's probably, yeah, I don't know if Jan has this answer. It's a good question. We were yeah, a good question. Uh, uh, calculating like for instance with the wind turbine blades, I mean, really yesterday with the, with the partner we were discussing indeed, is it, would it be possible to uh, actually process two and a half windmill blade per hour to produce uh, bus stops, um, uh, yeah, urban furniture, etc. I mean, you would need probably a couple of uh, different, um, um, yeah, construction companies all working on this uh, throughout Europe in order to uh, accommodate this demand. Um, but of course, this creates new labor. So um, if you are going to incinerate them, um, there's maybe three people working on the same volume while uh, you can create more valuable um, yeah, examples and creating labor. So we're always looking at how we can we create multiple benefits. And 
uh, we have not done this on this scale. Uh, I would say that most of the projects we are doing are mainly to show like, okay, this is actually possible. Um, we see now a scaling up of uh, different projects, really like larger scale uh, corporations uh, want to include this way of working in their uh, in housing or in, in public building. Uh, and it's also going to be required by uh, public uh, administration. So that's an interesting uh, topic where actually companies need to find solutions to start doing it. Good. I, sorry, I just want to add one um, one point on this topic. I think uh, yeah, the problem about the wind turbines is the material use or the composite material use that is very complex to recover. So in reality, there are many different experimentation. They are trying to use a different kind of materials that is more easy to reuse. And that would be probably, I think, the future. Um, but the, just, uh, I think, so starting from the design, so probably again, the design can be taught in a different way than the, the, the material they are actually using. So the, uh, probably there is time for one last question. I want to pick, um, so this one from Heike, and that the rest of the question, if haven't been re replied, we will do it by email. There was just one question, very simple. So how we can contact Tondo, this is a, you can write to us at info at tondo.tech. Or, yeah, or you can go to on our website. In any case, we will send an email after the webinar with all uh, the, with the video and uh, with all the ways to, to contact us. So it will be very easy. You will receive this email and also the instruction to contact us. We are definitely open to every kind of collaboration and, um, and to people that in any way want to support our mission. So let's answer the last question. So hi, hi Max. Uh, I would have uh, one question, okay? Uh, what could, should the municipality politics first do uh, to push circular economy structure in the city? Um, okay, thanks. So probably this is what we answered at the beginning. I will uh, let Max do it, but I think, um, yeah, everything starts with a vision, I think. Uh, and after, yeah, you probably, the material flow analysis that they've done to understand where, and after also, the point of writing awareness, supporting with different kinds of instruments from uh, policies, uh, public procurement, uh, management of urban places. This is my point of view, but I also want uh, let Max to, to answer. Yeah, no, completely. I think I completely emphasize the importance of a vision and to lead by example, basically, and, and put a dot on the horizon like Rotterdam has done. Um, and then things follow and things organically follow behind it. Um, I mean, interestingly, it has different levels of it. So Rotterdam's ambition to become fully circular by 2050, that's a response to the Dutch government, national government, uh, setting this ambition for all the cities. So you can see almost there's this cascading chain. Um, someone has to start, someone has to lead by example, but then things uh, align um, and fall in order. And maybe another one, a, a very practical thing that cities can do is that they have enormous purchasing power within yeah. their local um, uh, area um, so that they can really stimulate the market demand for circular, uh, certain circular um, uh, products and services as well. So through procurement, by having circular criteria um, that they grade procurement on, um, they can have a direct impact within the city pretty um, quickly as well. Yeah. And the last point I want to probably highlight is, is again regulations. So sometimes can be complex, really, to develop. This is what we are actually facing with the projects we want to develop. So sometimes can be really difficult, even if you want to develop a circular project, sometimes regulation really stop you. And so also being more flexible, open, uh, collaborate with pri private entity and uh, support them and in different ways, and then that yeah. can be also very important. And to that end, I mean, the port has a, a nice example of, um, but it's applied in other cities as well, is having these regulation light um, innovation or living labs, um, for example. So you have certain districts which have low regulation, which really stimulate these kind of innovations. Of course, that helps if you're in a port where you don't have too many people around you and you can make bad smells and everything. Um, but you can also apply them within a city, within a certain neighborhood, Amsterdam has some really nice, nice examples of uh, Bauxlauterham, the district, of having this kind of lower regulation zone to simulate uh, testing. Okay, so still a few questions are coming, but we are already five minutes in delay. So we will reply to the answer with the specific email after. 
And uh, again, thanks uh, Jan, thanks Max for joining. I think it was super interesting. I'm super happy about your participation and I hope we can do more some kind of collaboration in the future with both of you. It would be really, really interesting. Okay? Thank you. Thanks Good. everyone for joining as well. Thank you. Thank you everyone nice for joining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.